Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Does this thing work? Oh, that's for that. So I still have to shout. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so how many of you are like beginners at this? Okay. Sorry about the rest of you. I have to cater to beginners. <laughs> the lowest common denominator here. So I'm going to start with a test. And the test is, what is the purpose of taxes? Sorry. Yep, that's okay. You're late for the exam. You didn't know we were going to start with an exam. Okay. Uh, any, anybody, don't answer, but just how many people think they know the answer to that? Okay, now should I like, uh, where should I start? We'll go alphabetically. Anybody begin with A? No. Okay, so you had the first hand up. Purpose of taxes? Uh, to induce labor. To induce labor. Anybody else? <laughs> that, that's not bad. That's not bad. Okay. But I'm looking for something a little more uh, specific. Yeah. Control purchasing power. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah. Okay, who was going to say, other than Jan, <laughs> to create unemployment? The purpose of taxes is to create unemployment, right? What is unemployment? Unemployment is people looking for work who can't, at least initially, find it. Who can't find the work. And, and it's not just work, it's about paid work. Like I say, I've got lots of jobs in the Virgin Islands. If anybody wants to come down, I'm just not going to pay anything. Okay, so is there still unemployment in this country? Yeah, it's about paid work. Okay. And so the purpose of taxes is to create people looking for paid work. And paid work is unemployment by definition. So there can't be any unemployment okay, without the tax to begin with. Okay, so, let, let's, um, so why is, so now we come down to, am I too elementary for some of you guys? We are so far? Okay, so why does the government tax? Okay, because it wants to provision itself in the first instance. Right? The government wants soldiers, it wants legal system, it wants to buy vote. Oh, no, I didn't say that. There's all kinds of reasons. The government wants to provision itself, right? Okay, so how does it do that? So some of you are better at history than I am, but one way is to just conquer somebody and take slaves. Then you can provision your government, build your public works. Or you can, uh, the British, you'd wake up in the morning after drinking with a bump on your head and you're on a boat, right, in the British Navy, impressed sailors. And what we consider more civilized, which apparently is what the Egyptians did, I think, is we create a tax on something nobody has, and then we offer jobs that pay the thing they need to pay the tax, so that they, we can move their labor from private domain to public domain. Okay, so. Number one, we want to provision government. We do it with a tax, which creates unemployment. Okay, and then spending shifts the resources from private to public domain. It's at the point of spending when the real tax is paid. That's when people actually move from private sector to public sector. Okay. Spending the otherwise, in this case, worthless currency. Okay. So I was just on a little grassroots tour of Italy. And to, and to explain this, I would take out I started off the same way, and I said, anybody want a job that pays in my business cards? And I said, I hope you have enough sense not to take it, because these things are worth nothing, right? You can check eBay, they are worth nothing. Okay. I said, but, so now I can't hire anybody with these. But now I'm going to tell you there's one more thing going on. There's only one door out of here. There's a guy there with a 9 millimeter. He works for me. And you can't get out of here without one of these cards. Now you're all unemployed. Now you're all looking for paid work in this card, and you can't find it. Because there isn't any way to get these cards. 
Now I offer you all a job. If you stay afterwards for 10 minutes and help clean, the room up, clean up the room, polish the floor, I'll pay you one card for working 10 minutes. Okay. Now you will all, now you will all, now I can spend these otherwise worthless cards, right? You need them to pay the tax to get out of the room. Okay, now let's say there's 50 people in this room. And I decide I'm only going to spend 40 cards. Ten of you guys aren't going to be able to find work. You're going to be unemployed. Okay. And let me show you something else. And I'll show you. The, see the back of this card? There's no gold behind this card. Okay. But you're still willing to work for it, even with no gold behind it. Why? Because you need it to pay the tax. And you are unemployed. So now. There, if, I, if there's 50 people, I only spend 40, there are going to be 10 unemployed, at least. Somebody might earn more than one, but there are going to be at least 10 unemployed, and there's no, no possible way they can get a job, no matter how many structural reforms I make. No matter what level of education they might be. You might all have advanced degrees in cleaning the floor. Okay? But you're still not going to be able to get a job. Now, it would be better if you did. I'm going to have a better floor from those 40 people working and 10 others breathing down their neck, but it's not going to solve unemployment. Now, why else w might you want this card? You might want to save one. People walk around with cash in their pockets. Now, why would any of you want to save one? Well, maybe you want to take one home to prove to your husband or wife that you were actually in an economics lecture, right? <laughs> so let's say you all decided, you know, you wanted to save one card. Well, now, when I offer jobs, I'm going to spend at least 100 cards, because you're all going to have one to pay the tax and one to save, right? To take home to prove you were here. But what if I only decide to spend 90? Unemployment. Why? Because I'm not spending enough to cover the need to pay the tax and the need to save. Is there any other possible reason there could be unemployment? And the answer is no. Okay. So you got the government, the United States government, taxes $3 trillion. Spend, actually it's 3.5 this year. Taxes $3.5 trillion. Spends $4 trillion. It spent $500 billion deficit. It's spending more than it's co uh, collecting, right? There's still unemployment. What does that mean? It hasn't spent enough to cover the tax bill and the need to save. It probably needed to spend $5 trillion to cover all the savings desires, to not have the unemployment. Okay. I, so the point is, unemployment is always and necessarily a case where the government has not spent enough of its currency to cover the tax bill and the need to save. Because it means there's still people willing to work for that thing to get out of here. Now, the answer to that is either to spend more or tax less. It's any, that's a political decision. Right? But that's always going to be the case. So, that is like the basics of the whole thing. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of things that follow from this. For example, why was, I, why was my guy collecting cards? So I could get them to be able to pay you? No. I had to pay you first and then collect the cards. It's impossible for the other way around. Okay, just like a football stadium. They have to get the tickets out there before they can collect them. They don't collect the tickets first and then sell them. Okay, it's backwards. Now, if you go in the old days when we used to live in New York and there were subway tokens, Guys were selling them and people were dropping them in the thing. You could watch them going around and around and you could say, oh, I see how it works. First they collect the tokens, then they sell them. But the New Yorkers, you know, we'd say, no, nah. first they sell them, then they collect them. Well, you can't tell by watching them go around. Every congressman says we have to get the dollars first before we can spend them. We've got to get them through what well, we don't get through taxing. We have to borrow from China and leave the debt to our grandchildren. They got it backwards. They spend first and then they borrow. Okay, it has to be. There's no other way to do it. So again, for the analogy, I've got my cards. I pay you first. You pay the guy. I pay you enough to save. If I was the government, I would then borrow back 
your savings. The money I just spent. First, I, the government, they don't actually give you cards. Hi. They credit your account. And then they borrow the same dollars they just stuck in your account at the Fed, put them in another account called the Treasury Security, a securities account. And that's called borrowing money. So you, you each, I give you each, you each earn 50 cards to pay the tax, another 50 to save. And I say, wait a minute, I'll hold those cards for you in a different account over here called the Treasury Security. I'll pay you some interest in more cards. Now, do you mind doing that? You know, I'll, I'll send a note to your uh, husband or wife so you can still prove you're here, right? <laughs> you can bring home the bank statement. Okay, and uh, would you do that? Well, most people would do that. Let's assume you'd do that. Some people hold cash, but most people would want their money in the bank or in a treasury security. Okay, that's what the government does. Now, why do they do that? Do they do it because, do I do that because I need to get your cards to borrow them back so that I can spend them? No. Okay. The, the reason actually is been lost. It's an anachronism back to the gold standard. Under the gold standard, the initial cards had gold on the other side. The money was convertible into gold at the treasury. But if you bought treasury securities, you couldn't convert it into gold until after they matured. So rather than have the whole gold supply at risk, the government would issue bonds and then the gold is safe for at least for a while and then when people wanted to cash their money in, they had gold for that. They had liquidity. Okay. And the same with any fixed exchange rate. Hong Kong, right now, fixed exchange rates. I think Bulgaria, fixed exchange rates. Okay. But for the United States today, it's entirely inapplicable. So, taxes, why did I tax you? I wanted the room clean. Creates unemployment. I can then hire the unemployed that I created. Why on earth would I create more unemployed than I want to hire? What am I, just being mean or something? It's got to be either cruelty or stupidity, right? Anybody want to vote? <laughs> Secret ballot <laughs> on what's going on with government here? Okay, it's largely stupidity. <laughs> there is an element of cruelty, but it's largely stupidity. Okay, on what they're doing and how they're doing it. President Obama just recently was talking about student loans, and he said, uh, you know, eventually the government's going to run out of money and we're going to have to have another way to get it. Like, what? <laughs> so let's now ratchet it up just a notch, small notch, and we'll talk about actual monetary operations. Uh, any questions so far? Anything the model doesn't explain? Like, why do people who work for cards who aren't getting taxed? Everybody understands that? No? Anybody care? Yeah, I'm presupposing I've got a guy with a 9 millimeter. Now, what you have to do as a group is saying, we, so here's how, it, here's how it comes to exist. We're sitting here, and we brought lunch in, and everybody's throwing their stuff all over the floor. And we're saying, look, it would be a good idea if we clean this place up before we left. So how are we going to do it? We tried volunteers last time. Everybody left, because <laughs> they all had something to do. And now we've got twice as much stuff on the floor. So what, how are we going to do this? I said, look. I got an idea. Let's elect some, let's put somebody in charge, like me, <laughs> for life. <laughs> Irrevocable. <laughs> I know a little Spanish. Make me uh, president for life. Um, and give me the authority to have a guy at the door with a gun. Give me the authority to tax everybody. Then everybody will have to put in their equal share, and it's going to be fair to everybody. And because the voluntary thing isn't fair to everybody. We proved that communism doesn't work. <laughs> we, we, and so what do you think? Let's vote on this. Okay? And people vote it down. The stuff keeps piling up, right? Or something else happens. But if people vote yes, we want the government collected. We want to give them the right to provision themselves to take care of public services. And we grant government this right through the Constitution and our way, you know, whatever. And so, yes, that has to come first. I have to get the authority to have somebody there. Or... I invented a gun. <laughs> I took authority, right? And, uh, you know, changed my name to Vladimir, and I put him out there, and then I used this to my personal advantage. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, it is, a, it is a system that is ultimately using coercion to get something done for public purpose at public initiative if there's a constitution with, you know, representative government or for somebody else's individual purpose who has power through some other means. 
And if there's another way to do it, fine. But we're, right now, for the moment, we're talking about this way. <laughs> this is what we do. Okay, you don't, you don't want to mess with the IRS, right? You know, banks are government agents. Why is the penalty for bank robbery higher than murder? <laughs> it's like, a, it's just, okay, it's, it's our system. Uh, somebody else? Okay, so now we, we'll, we'll shift to uh, reserve accounting. <laughs> so the best way to think of the Federal Reserve is, the, the best way to think of the Federal Reserve Bank is that it's a bank. And what is a bank? A bank is a spreadsheet. It's got debits, it's got accounts, which are just like spaces, <laughs> information. Okay, and, you, and, the, and the, whoever runs this thing can make the numbers in the accounts larger or smaller. So uh, for another analogy, let's say we're all in a big card game here, and I'm the scorekeeper. Okay, well, how many points do I have? I don't have any points. Well, then how do I give you 50 points if you win? Well, where did I get them from? I don't get them from anywhere. I write them down in your account. Accounting, after the fact, record keeping. You account for what you did. You, 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 it's a historical record of what you did. So I put 50 in your account there. And then somebody else gets 100 and I put 100 there. Do I, am I now short 150? Have I lost 150? No. Will I have an account that shows how many total points I put out? Sure. That's my account here. Put out 50, or I put out 100, now I've given out 150. I balance my books to see if it's right. 100, 150, 150 in my account. Pot's right, okay. Let's keep going. Am I, I could say that I'm in deficit. If I want, it's not wrong because it's a debit. It's a lower number. I'm minus 150 and that's 150. Uh, somebody else, you know, loses points. It goes negative. Do I have more? No. Okay. That's how the monetary system works. The Federal Reserve has banks that are members and they all have accounts. And when it spends, it changes the number up in some bank's account. And there are also foreign governments that have accounts. Spending is a credit. The account number goes up. Debit, uh, taxing is a debit. The number is going down. Is the government getting anything or losing anything? Is there any actual money at the Fed? No. Chairman Bernanke was asked, where did you get those hundreds of billions for the banks? Was that taxpayer money? No, we just use the computer to mark up the numbers in their account. There's no other way to do it. And so, um, so where does borrowing come in? The central bank has two kinds of accounts. Most banks would call these checking and savings. Checking in a CDs or something, right? They have different names for them. Time deposits. Okay, let's call them checking and savings. Everybody okay with that? Am I losing anybody here? <laughs> Good. <laughs> checking, saving. The Federal Reserve calls the checking a reserve account. Why? I don't know. It's a Federal Reserve Bank. It's a checking account with a fancy name, giving it a reserve account, calling it a reserve account. The time deposit, the savings account, what do they call that? They call it a U.S. Treasury security, a treasury bond, a treasury note, a treasury bill. They're all just CDs, time deposits. You give them dollars, you get them back with interest, like any other bank time deposit. Okay, everybody good? Checking accounts, reserve accounts, savings accounts, they call them securities accounts. That's the insider's name, securities accounts, reserve accounts, and securities accounts. So, the Federal Reserve spends, uh, the Treasury spends $4 trillion. They tell the central bank to credit the account of who won the lottery for $4 trillion. Kelly? Kelly won. Okay, they credit the account, somebody's account, JP Morgan won the lottery. <laughs> they get $4 trillion credited to their account. The number goes up. Where did it come from? From anywhere. They just credited the account. Little story back, I was working at William Blair and Company uh, in the 70, late 70s. My guy from the back office calls me up. Hey, the Fed just made a mistake through the Bank of New York. They were supposed to give us $30,000. They gave us $300 million. True story. <laughs> back when that was a lot of money in 1979. Okay? I go, uh, what happened? He says, well, you know, they got those adding machines with the zero, the double zero, and the triple zero. The guy accidentally hit the triple zero. <laughs> it's like, great, can we go spend it? He goes, well, you know, it's 4.30, the wire's closed. He said, but interest rates were 12%. We're gonna make 
$100,000 overnight. <laughs> it's like, great. <laughs> Back when that was a lot of money to make in one day for doing nothing, right? All right. So where, that was good money. We could spend it. Where did it come from? It came from the guy's thumb. <laughs> That's where all the money came from until they went to computers. Now it comes from some programmer or something. I don't know. But it's still just a number in the account. He calls me back two hours later. Uh, I have to give it back. <laughs> they go, what happened? He said, well, I got a call from high, way up in the bank in New York. Somebody I never talked to before. And he said, send it back. <laughs> he goes, and I said, what are you talking about? He goes, he goes, you know what I'm talking about. Send it back. <laughs> he goes, well, the wire's closed. They go, well, we'll open it. <laughs> So anyway, he, sent him, he buckled under the pressure and sent it back. Now what did the wire open mean? They just turned the computer back on, so they subtracted it from our account, and I don't, I don't, they didn't add it anywhere because they weren't even supposed to. <laughs> I guess they must have had a debit in the Fed account, so they added it back to the, they, they reversed the trade. Point is, it doesn't come from anywhere. So the Treasury spends, the Fed just uses their thumb, puts the numbers in the account. That's, that's there. Okay. Then they tax three and a half trillion. Now they change the four trillion down to four trillion minus three and a half trillion, five hundred billion. Now there's five hundred billion in somebody's account in the economy, and the government has calls that a deficit. Its account is minus five hundred. Okay, and somebody's is plus five hundred. The guys at the CBO working like mad every day to balance the checkbook, right? Okay, the government's minus 500. Who's got it? I went to J.P. Morgan, then I went to Bank of New York, then I went to this guy, and they add them all up, all over. 499, uh, close enough, let's go home. No. <laughs> they've got to find the, to the penny or they've made a mistake. Every debit's got to have a credit. So the government's deficit is somebody's credit. It's somebody's savings. Let's call it savings. Savings can be anything. For now, let's call that monetary savings. So when I spent 100 cards and only collected 50 because you wanted to save them, I ran a deficit. Spent 100, only collected 50. Okay, got a letter from the IMF, 100% of GDP deficit. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> but I know my deficit's equal to your savings. I know if I spent 100 and collected 50, somebody's got the 50. Now this is advanced math. That's why you're in economics, because of your advanced math capabilities. But that's all there is to it, to the penny. Okay, so the government's run a deficit. Now there's 500 billion in the uh, reserve account. Well, now what happens? Okay, now what they do, exactly what I did, they borrow their own money back. <laughs> and, and that's the rhetoric, but what do they do? They issue treasury securities. They say, we have securities accounts available. We have a savings account available. Please move your money from your checking account to your savings account, okay, because we want you to. <laughs> I'll get into the reason, but that's what they do. And so they have an auction, and it goes to the highest bidder. And it goes to the highest bidder through the primary dealers of 50, 40 people that are guaranteed enough money to have a pretty decent-sized house for the weekend in the uh, Hamptons <laughs> off of this whole thing. Of the whole, not just that operation. That operation actually loses the money, but it's a loss leader. Whole other story. Anyway, um, and they will bid on these treasuries. Oh, I will. It's a three-month bill. We'll take it at ten basis points. I'll take it at nine. I'll take it at eight. The highest bidder wins. And then, thank goodness, the treasury has been able to borrow. Okay. And when they securities get paid for, the Fed debits the checking and credits to savings. They shift the dollars from, from reserve accounts at the Fed to securities accounts at the Fed. So let's look at it with China now. Our bankers. With Obama and Clinton and Geithner over there on their knees making sure that we can fund health care and, and bomb Syria. <laughs> because what if China didn't want to fund our debt? How could we ever spend any money? So let's look at let's trace trace the series of events. China decides to sell tires to Walmart. Okay, so they sell a billion dollars worth of tires to Walmart. And dollars get shifted from Walmart's banker, JP Morgan, to you know, their their 
checking account at the Fed to China's checking account at the Fed, the reserve account. Now China has a billion dollars in their reserve account at the Fed. And now what do we want, what, what's the next thing they do? They look at the market and say, well, that doesn't pay much interest. I like the two-year treasury at 30 basis points, so I'd rather buy some of those. And so they go into the auction and they buy 30-year treasuries. And they, when the, the, on the uh, settlement day, the 15th of the month, the Fed automatically shifts the dollars from China's checking account to China's brand new savings account at the Fed. Okay, they shift the dollars. That's called going into debt to China. When it was in their checking account, it's not the debt. It goes into their savings account, that is the debt. Now the national debt has $17 trillion in savings accounts. Some of those dollars are in China's name. Some are in Fannie Mae's name, other government agents. Some are in your name, maybe. I don't know. Could be anybody. Dollars in savings accounts at the Fed. How is it paid back? What happens on the 15th when the debt comes due? The Fed shifts the dollar balance with interest from savings back to checking. Paid. Done. No grandchildren, no taxpayers anywhere in sight. I've been in there. I couldn't find them. I was looking under the table. <laughs> This is a debt we're leaving to our grandchildren. Next time somebody tells you, how are we going to pay it all back? How are we going to uh, debit the securities account and credit the reserve account? Like, what's your, what's the question? You know, like, why are you asking? That's all it is. Right? And so, we are flying over to China and making concessions on human rights and nuclear weapons in Korea because we're worried about China shifting their dollars from checking to savings at the Fed? Yes. Uh, what else can I tell you? What, how's our uh, the time here is such that what should I go into? Do you guys want to go into like quantitative easing and all that? Or do you want to just talk about um, the national economy and where it's going and the unemployment? You, you sort of know where it's coming from. The deficit's too small. It's always because the deficit's too small. My proposals are simple. A full payroll tax holidays, suspend all the FICA taxes, which will increase sales, um, spending, and jobs are always a function of sales. A restaurant doesn't fire people when they're full. They don't lay off the busboy when this table, you know, when the restaurant's full. Okay, I don't care how much they hate the taxes and the regulation, you know, and they go into their Tea Party meetings, but if it's full, they're not going to lay anybody off, no matter how much they hate government. If it's empty, they're not going to hire a new busboy, okay, no matter like how much, you know, we cut their taxes or how much profits they have or how, many, how much money they have for capital investment. It's all a function of servicing customers. And the more customers you can service for the fewer people, the better. That's what productivity is about. But we've got to keep, you know, enough spending money, enough demand so people have enough money to pay the tax and that's saved. And then there's like automatically, I go into how, full employment in the economy. Okay. Uh, and so my first proposal is a full payroll tax holiday. So we stop taking $600 a month out of the average family's income and let them just go out and resume a normal standard of living and we'll be back to where we were. Now there's plenty of other micro problems involved, uh, you know, out there, but that addresses, I think that'll address the unemployment problem entirely. We've got one thing that's critical to go with it, and that is the problem is you get the economy going, sales are up, uh, the engineering firm goes to hire people, the uh, Best Buy goes to hire people because people are buying stuff. They look at the unemployment, people have been unemployed for three months, six months, a year, they don't want to hire any of them. It's too risky. Okay, they might be on drugs, they might not show up on time, they might get in fights, you know, they might sue. Uh, they want to hire people who are already working. You probably all run into that. And, uh, and so what I've proposed, to go with this, to take care of that, is a $10 an hour transition job to anybody willing and able to work. I don't care if you just got out of jail, it doesn't matter. Anybody willing and able to work to help with the transition from unemployment, which is public sector, to private sector employment. Right? And Because then it eliminates, uh, it reduces the tendency to labor bottlenecks and it makes the unemployed more liquid. Unemployment's a buffer stock policy where you go into it when things are bad and you come out of it when things are good, but it's turned into Roach Motel, okay, where you go in and you can't get out. And to make it two-way, like any other buffer stock, you want to keep the buffer stock liquid and healthy. 
if you've got a butter buffer stock, agricultural, you don't like let it go bad and rancid, then when the market picks up, you can't sell it out. So we use unemployment as a price anchor. This uses an employed buffer stock policy. And you can read more details about it. Those are the two critical employment you know, proposals that would immediately reverse what's going on now. At least 20 million people would be working again, producing real output, booming economy. Now, one of the targets that you want to use, you say how far to go, you want to go, is the idea of a full employment uh, deficit or surplus. So what they do now is they look at the economy and they say, if we're at full employment, if we're at 4% unemployment, what would the budget deficit be? And they'll go, oh, it'd be a surplus. Great. The way to get the deficit down is to get everybody working and then all those taxes, and so we need a deficit now so that later we can get a surplus. Well, yeah, if you run my program and get the deficit now and you get a surplus, you know, that's good. You get go to full employment. But if you let taxes go up, it's, it's what they call the automatic stabilizers. Taxes go up, unemployment compensation goes down. If it brings the deficit into surplus, you're going to kill the economy, just like Clinton did. Clinton let the economy go from deficit to surplus. It collapsed in 2001, and Bloomberg News reported the surplus that just ended was the longest since 1927 to 1930. <laughs> do those dates ring a bell for anybody? <laughs> okay. You don't want to do that. Yeah, it does bring the deficit down, but that's not the good thing. The good thing is the full employment. You want to make sure you don't let it come down so far that it chokes off the economy. That's why it's called automatic stabilizer. It works in both directions, down and up. It, it cushions the blow by letting the deficit go up, and then it cuts the whole expansion short by getting the deficit too small. So you want to target things. So at full employment, you've got maybe a 4 or 5% deficit. So, so full employment is sustainable. Okay, not so when you get there, it's going to collapse again, like it's done every time, every five or 10 years for the last 200 years. Well, apart from that, there's no pattern. But <laughs> okay. those are all exceptions. You know, we did, if we'd done interest rates correctly, it's nonsense. Okay, so what you want, so I think with this payroll tax cut, I think we'd be targeting, if they don't monkey too much with tax code, four or 5% deficit. But if we see that it's getting too small, be on the alert. Okay, we had a good economy in 99, and because of the huge private sector debt bubble, you know, fine, but be prepared when the private sector can't increase its debt anymore to be able to step in and either cut taxes or raise spending, depending on your politics, to, uh, to sustain full employment. Okay, they weren't ready to do that in 2000, 2001, 2008, 2009. They did a little bit. Not nearly what was needed, obviously. How do I know? Count the bodies in the unemployment line. They can only come from not enough uh, spending to cover your own tax plus your own savings desires that you created. Okay, so I have a few other proposals because there are other areas I don't like. They're not necessarily economics related like my uh, campaign finance reform where everybody can give all the money they want. I don't care if you're a corporation, individual, sovereign wealth fund, global, all the money you want, but 40% goes to the opposition. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> takes a lot of a lot of sting and the regulation out of it, and I, and I think we go a long way to take the money, the influence of money out of politics. And I can go through healthcare proposals, all kinds of things. Yes, go. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. yeah. So what is QE? Q QE says. Um, and it's also caused global warming. Just look at the statistics. It's gone up in the last three months. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> Why not, right? And it's kept the elephants out of this room. You don't see any. Okay, so uh, it's called a placebo. <laughs> you know they have placebo surgery now? They'll do placebo knee surgery, like they have 10 knee patches, and some of them they won't actually do anything, and they find that they have like just as much <laughs> success. <laughs> and they do placebo brain surgery also successfully, and there's like a big outrage that you shouldn't be allowed to do this. <laughs> yeah, charge, shouldn't be allowed to charge for it. <laughs> it's kind of the lottery. <laughs> charge double. <laughs> so, uh, so what actually is QE? I'm a mon operations nuts and bolts guy. So the Fed comes in to buy securities. 
first of all, how would you even know? <laughs> you, you've got some treasury bills, you're watching the prices, you say, now, you know, I think I want to sell these today. Oh, the price is up on my 10-year notes by a quarter of a point. Yeah, I think I'll sell them. But you don't know if it's the Fed or it's, you know, some guy from Saudi Arabia or it's JP Morgan. You have no idea. But anyway, the Fed comes in as a buyer. And if they came in in secret, who would even know or care? Nobody. And they buy securities. And what happens when they do that? Well, if you're the seller of securities, what's the security? It's a it's savings account, right? When you sell your treasury bond, your 10-year treasury bond, your 10-year CD, you decide to get out, the dollars get shifted from savings back to checking. Okay. Okay, so what? Let's say you're a pension fund and you've decided you don't want to have 10-year treasuries anymore because you don't think 270 is a good yield. So you sell them. It happens to be to the Fed. Your dollars go from your checking, your savings to your checking. What, do you go run out and buy a new house or something? No. The, the, these savings are savings that have already been determined uh, as savings. Okay? This money's already been allocated. This percentage of your portfolio is already unspent. If you wanted to spend it, you could have just as easily spent the money the day before. The people who just sold their securities could have sold them the day before or the day after. But what happens is the, the, the interest rates are always at indifference levels. They go to indifference levels where the economy as a whole is indifferent between fewer securities and more cash. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to spend any more. And in fact, there's no evidence that it, there is any even psychological reason for them to spend more. But additionally, the savings accounts pay interest and the checking accounts, for all practical purposes, don't. And so when you decide to do that, the economy is losing the interest income on that, on those dollars. Well, how much is that? Well, last year the Fed turned over $90 billion to the Treasury profits from quantitative easing from owning these securities, lowering the deficit. They took $90 billion that the, would have been in the economy and gave it back to the Treasury. They reduced the deficit by $90 million. That's a negative. It's a tax. It's not exactly like the guy with the gun, but it's a tax. You know, it's, it's a force and that the Fed's going to do it at some price. Okay. This year it's going to be more because the mortgage-backed securities are buying. And, and by the way, somebody asked before, they're not junk or toxic waste. They're just other government-guaranteed mortgage-backed securities. So it's still just accounts at the Fed. Okay. They have an even higher interest rate. So the Fed's probably going to, uh, I don't know, $110 billion or something this year, removed from the economy. Okay, is it any surprise that in the real economy you can see no sign whatsoever of quantitative easing? And if you look at nominal growth, it's actually going down. Not necessarily just from quantitative easing, but it is going down. They're partially responsible for removing interest income. Right? And um, it's certainly not spiking up anywhere. Why? Well, the banks refuse to lend. It's like Because they have the money, but they refuse to lend. Banks lending is never constrained by the money. Banks always have infinite liquidity. It's limited by their capital. And right now their capital is like 10%. It's way over requirements. And there's more to be raised if they need it. So right now there's no restriction on bank lending except people who want to borrow. Okay. And what causes people to want to borrow? Well, part of it's your income. <laughs> All right, so you're the economy. You're Mr. and Mrs. Economy. You're walking into the bank. You want to take out a loan. And the banker looks at your request and he says, okay, well, interest rates are down a little bit. That helps. It's nice. But I see your income's down. Which one is more important? Income. That's just the way banks are. Why? Federal regulation. It all comes back to the same thing. But income is more important. Okay? So for the economy as a whole, they're hurting the ability to leverage by removing the income much more. The second thing is rates are not necessarily down. They might even be up like they are now. Why? Because people believe quantitative easing works. So what does work mean? It means it makes the economy better. Well, what's the Fed's reaction function? What does the Fed do when the economy gets better? It raises rates. So if they do QE, now the economy is going to be getting better just around the corner. And the Fed's going to be raising rates. I don't want any long-term treasuries. I don't care if the Fed's bought all but one. I don't want that last one. <laughs> And in fact, I want to take out a mortgage and pay fix for, because they're going to be raising rates. So if, if people believe that quantitative easing works, they're keeping long rates higher than otherwise because they think the rate hike is just around the corner. Okay, and why would you? Okay, so it backfires. And that's what happened in the first QE. <laughs> and, and pretty soon, 
you know, they don't know if it works or it doesn't work. So maybe it won't fix the economy. Well, then why are they doing it? Well, then rates will come down. Well, they don't know what they're doing. They do know what they're doing. The Fed's going, we, we just, in two papers at Jackson Hole, just showed it doesn't do anything. That moving dollars from checking to savings, savings to checking doesn't do anything. Can you imagine if there's a sudden announcement saying, oh my God, uh, you know, Bank America just had, you know, a trillion dollars shift from savings to checking. That's going to cause inflation. It was like, like, what are you talking about? What difference does it make which bank this happens in? If it's the Fed or Bank of America, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't do anything. So they got these studies that somebody funded with a lot more money than it would take to fund this whole department for the rest of your life to determine, and two papers were presented at Jackson Hole that showed that quantitative easing doesn't do anything. <laughs> and so now the Fed's there. Um, okay, quantitative doesn't do anything, but it, it has risk, undefined. They don't know what the risks are, which makes it even more of a risk. If, at least if you knew what the risks are, you, you could deal with it. But these are undefined risks, right? Known and unknown in uh, my old buddy Don Rumsfeld, right? So, uh, uh, so we need to get out of this thing before something jumps up and bites us that we don't know about. And so what are the markets supposed to decide? They're getting out of it. They must have believed it was going to do something or they wouldn't have got in. Now they're seeing risks, and they're going to sell bonds Okay, and go to cash. The Fed's selling its bonds and going to cash. What's going on here? So they're going crazy. Interest rates spike up in the long term. Nobody wants to get in the way of the Fed. Don't fight the Fed is what they always say. And, you know, the whole thing starts falling apart. Meanwhile, GDP keeps getting revised down. First quarter was 2. Point, well, it was originally estimated at 3.1, revised down to 2.5, 1.8. It was 1.1 in the last revision. It's like, what's going on here? Uh, Q, uh, Q2 just came out at two and a half. Oh, look good in the headlines, but underneath it, inventory accumulation and exports. Would, otherwise, it would have been like what? They say, well, inventory, they spin. Inventory accumulation is good. It means there's advanced orders. Or it means they built stuff and can't sell it. You know? <laughs> Which one is it? Well, consumer spending went from 2.3 to 1.8. But we think it's going to go up. So therefore, our forecast is for higher. This is uh, Deutsche Bank. Oh, you know Dutch Bank. How are they getting three percent? They're still at three percent confirmed today. Just as Goldman went to one and a half for Q3. Anyway, so <laughs> so every all this mixed stuff is flying around. In the meantime, interest rates are up hundred basis points in the long end, and the and the Fed minutes come out, and a large chunk I forget what they call it several or many or I don't know they got all these words for how many now I can't keep up with this stuff said that they didn't think the higher rates would affect the, negatively affect the economy because stock market's up. Right. Okay, these are the guys that agonize over whether they should raise or lower the Fed funds rate by an eighth of a point because of these dramatic effects it's supposed to have on the economy. Suddenly, a hundred base point move, oh, it's not going to do anything. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> these are political choices. Raise your hand and vote. Uh, mortgage applications, bang, down. <laughs> Might be a clue. High rates are actually good for the economy because the borrowers pay more, but the savers get it. And the government's a net payer of interest. So the government pays the higher rates. And that, you know, 100 billion or whatever the 300 billion the economy is earning on interest goes to 400 or more. It adds to the deficit. But right now we've got some special situations. So the rates on mortgages go up. That would help the saver if the borrower bought the house and bought it. But when he sees the rates, he doesn't borrow. So the loan's not there. The saver can't invest it for and a half because nobody's borrowing it for and a half. The government's paying it, but the Fed's buying it and taking the money. <laughs> so it's not helping any. All it's doing is knocking down a sector that at the moment has been driven by supply side and things other than a booming economy. And it's cheaper to own than to rent, stuff like this around the edges. A little bit of what we call a dead cat bounce, <laughs> the supply side effect. And all of a sudden, the housing is slowing down, and, and the home builder stocks are cratering. And to the question, the emerging markets are all falling apart, but that's an over-dramatization. Uh, India's currency went down 20%. It's a collapse. It proves that MMT is wrong. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> proves most of our economics is wrong because India's currency went down? Like, who said India's currency is going to go down if, you know, five trillion of sovereign wealth funds don't decide to sell it to next highest bidder, right? Wherever that is, and buy something else. 
Okay, so why were they in the Indian currency to begin with? Okay, well, for one thing, it was paying nice interest rate, U.S. interest rates for a while. Some people do that, maybe not. Banks don't do that, but speculators do that, right? People in India will borrow dollars instead of their own currency because they can borrow cheaper. Okay, it's a high-risk trade. Why would anybody do that? Why would Hungary borrow in, you know, yen? <laughs> but they do. You got home mortgages written in yen all over Europe. And then when the yen goes up, they're all screaming, government has to bail them out because they're losing money. But people do that. Right? So in India, you have all these businesses and everybody else borrowing dollars because it's cheaper or whatever. Uh, and, and it works for a while. While they're all going in, it goes up, okay, because it's relatively thin markets. Not, it's not that, they're not that deep. And then all of a sudden, when they see a threat over here that interest rates in the U.S. might go up, it's like, uh-oh. They all start running the other way, then it goes the other way, but it doesn't go to zero, which is my point here. You're going to get bids and offers and fluctuations, and they're going to look pretty large. Uh, a month ago, the yen dropped 25% in value. Nobody said, oh, no, there's the end of the world for the yen. You know, it's like, stabilize that. In Mexico, the peso crisis, which was fixed exchange rate, was different. It was it 94, I think? 1994? Uh, went from three and a half to nine or ten. Huge drop, but it should stay, it's still there. Okay, same thing in the um, East Asian countries. Drop 70%, still there. Russia blew up so bad in 1998. It went from 6.45 to the dollar to 28, and it's still there. And, and you talk about no confidence, nothing. The guys in the central bank didn't even shut the lights off, they just ran. <laughs> they didn't want to get shot. They couldn't clear a check for like three months because there was nobody pushing any buttons. The ruble didn't go to zero or infinity, whatever you want to call it. It just stabilized there. It's still there. So you get these one-time adjustments, but you don't get this move to hyperinflation. The rare times you do get moves to hyperinflation, they're for entirely different reasons. It's never for that. Turkey ran 100%. Uh, they had indexation, but they ran 100% inflation, 50% currency devaluation, double-digit real growth, I think, for what, 10 years. They didn't go to hyperinflation or anything. You can call that whatever you want, but it didn't like turn into Zimbabwe or anything like that. Zimbabwe was a, I don't know, 80, you might know the history better than I do. You know, 80% of their infrastructure destroyed, not productive capacity, nothing for sale. You keep spending the same money, including giving insiders loans from your banking system that they, where they sell the currency and buy foreign exchange to make sure they're taken care of. Yeah, you can drive currency down into hyperinflation. Uh, Weimar Republic, you deficit spend 50% a year to pay war reparations. Yeah, you can cause the currency to go down. But the day they stopped the policy, the inflation went to zero. And you can go to any of these places, and as soon as they change, it stops. And I'm okay, so anyway, so emerging markets, I think India has stabilized the last two days. Anybody see it today? As of yesterday, it had stopped. You know, it went through the same kind of swing Japan went through. About a, a third the swing of a fixed exchange rate blow up. Fixed exchange rate blow ups are much worse. It's just your normal ebb and flow of the currency. There's no reason for that to cause unemployment. In fact, you've got, if India had gone to the WTO and said, oh, look, we want to devalue our currency by 20%. Oh, no, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> you, know, you can't try and gain that kind of an advantage over the rest of the world. Okay, but then when it happens, it's, oh, this is a terrible thing. You know, it's like, you've got, look at China. Okay, what, what do we want to happen in China? Everybody says, what happens if China does this or that, sells all their dollars and the dollar goes down? You know, what, whatever would happen if that happened? At the same time, we're over there negotiating with China to do what? To make their currency stronger against the dollar and the dollar weaker. So here we are, scared to death about what might happen if the dollar weakens against their currency. While at the same time, we're sending trade negotiators to try and force them to allow the dollar to weaken against their currency. So here we're talking out of both sides of our mouth about what we want to happen. It's like that all that, this currency stuff doesn't matter that much. It matters if you're speculating up and down, doing stuff. It doesn't matter for the macro economy. It does not need to um, have, you know, you can sustain full employment the whole time, uh, you know, optimize your real terms of trade, let it, let it do what it wants to do. It's not gonna do anything bad. As long as you got this thing going, as long as you are internally stable, you wanna continue. If, uh, I was going to say, if you're indexing internally, like Latin America did, the currency goes down 20%, they give everybody a 20% raise. Yeah, then it goes down another 20, you give everybody a 20% raise. It's that indexation that causes inflation. 
And when Argentina pegged their currency and stopped the inflation, they outlawed the indexation. That was the critical part. Ah, which reminds me about, you got, I got to tell the story about our Argentina trip. <laughs> and uh, Jan here was with me, and Daniel Kozar from the Labor Ministry in Argentina brought us down there to talk to this group. <laughs> and how's the time? What do we have left? Okay. It's four now? Okay, good. So, um, so the history of this is Daniel's the guy who came here to the UMKC, <coughs> learned all this stuff, recognized the idea that you offer a job to anybody willing and able to work, transition job, the whole thing, actually did it. In 2001, when it blew up, the currency board with uh, 32 dead in the street, they reopened, floating the peso. Daniel somehow got through this program called the Hefe's program where all heads of household could get a job. And, and two million people over time, hey man, fixed? All right, I dropped my cell phone accidentally. Thank you. All right, way to go. 119. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Okay. So, um, and who would have guessed that and these were people who nobody ever thought would work in the private sector? They were paying them, I don't know, 100 pesos a month, some ridiculously small thing. And all, you know, two million people show up over a two year period. A million of them transition to private sector jobs never would have worked. Argentina had the strongest economy in the world. They didn't have the normal labor bottlenecks they would get in growth period. And uh, we went down and visited them and other people from UMKC did studies. Everyone was asked, what would you rather do? Come to work, get paid this small amount, or stay home and get the money? Everybody said they'd rather work. Okay? And they just wanted to be part of the civilization. And so you had somebody from an insurance company needed people working in the kitchen. They'd come over. You had these you know, women making soup for the kids. And they said, uh, we're looking for three people. Who do you have that's any good? Oh, this one, this one. They come to work every day. They're real friendly. They'll fit in well. Bang, hire. Okay. These people at their house, wherever they were, not working, never would have gotten a job. It's just not possible. As, you know, so not statistically possible. That's pretty dumb. So anyway, um, then a few years later, Daniel's gone. That department had some budget amount. Somebody wanted for some other money. They took the money, and so they stopped the program, even though it made no sense, but that's politics. So all of a sudden, they're in an economy, and there's labor shortages developing. And the idea is, let's reinstitute this program. You'll get another couple million people, and it'll feed your labor shortage. So myself, Jan, go down, meet Daniel there. We go into this room, all these guys wearing suits, from the central bank and from a progressive institute, right? Okay, so I, I start explaining the program. I'm, I'm the spokesman, and uh, one of them says, "Well, if we, you know, how much would the wage be?" So I go, "Well, what's the minimum wage?" And they go, "600 pesos a month." What was that? Two hundred dollars a month or so? So that's two hundred dollars a month. So I said, "I don't know, maybe half that. Three hundred pesos a month." So the guy says, "Okay, you're listening." <laughs> His quote says, well, if we pay those people that much, some of them might eat some meat. <laughs> if we pay those people that much, some of them might eat some meat. Okay. So I'm going like, okay, did I really just hear this? Can you imagine getting that out of a congressional hearing, somebody saying that, you know? And, and uh, Daniel is just like, turns red, you know, and, and Jan's here rolling his eyes like, <laughs> and, I, and I go to the guy, I don't know how, like, I don't miss a beat, and I said, well, look, you know, if the purpose of your current institutional arrangements is so that to make sure a substantial portion of your population can never eat any meat, you really don't need to hear the rest of this proposal. You're already doing a good job of it. <laughs> <laughs> so now Daniel's kind of squirming. And then they start talking in Spanish. And, and you told me what they said once. I don't know what it was, but he'll tell you after I've done here. And he says to me, he says, well, We've decided it might be okay for some of them to eat some meat, so we'd like to hear the rest of his proposal. <laughs> what did he say in Spanish? Do you remember? Do you remember the discussion? They were worried about running out of meat. This is the largest meat export in the world, with two thirds of the pompous empty. With China coming down to negotiate contracts where they point out the acreage and how they're going to go. It's like, and how much meat? You know, this guy, somebody might have a hamburger, so we got to. <laughs> They're talking about. 
<laughs> you know what, you go down there and you order dinner, all you get is meat. No vegetables, nothing. <laughs> they think like of meat coming out of their ears. <laughs> so anyway, uh, <laughs> so are there political obstacles to things? Yes. You know, does Argentina have a class structure that people don't realize? That Daniel then explained where um, if they're sitting at a table and you're a different category of public employee, you don't sit next to each other. If you do, you don't talk to each other. You, you go down there, you have a nice time, it's a good vacation, you don't realize what's going on in some of these places in terms of social structure. So uh, somebody asked a question, I don't know if I answered it. Who, whose question was that? Kelly? Kelly? Okay. Uh, any other questions specifically? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So look. Okay, so here, so the question is, is currency depreciation a bad thing? Right? Okay. Well, number one, you've got Japan, after a huge political fight, or, you know, decided to fly in the face of the World Trade Organization and everybody else and tell their life insurance companies to buy euro bonds and cause the currency to depreciate. Because they thought that was good public, currency depreciation was good public policy. Okay. If you ask anybody in the U.S., they want a strong dollar. They think that's good public policy. Of course, then they, meanwhile, they criticize China because the dollar's too strong and needs to be weaker. <laughs> so uh, what I look at is, like, what are we actually trying to do? And what we're trying to do is improve our standard of living. So what is your real wealth, your standard of living, not just the numbers on the scoreboard? Because that's what counts. And that's what modern monetary theory is really all about, optimizing what's the real world and using the currency as a tool so you get a better life, and what we call serves public purpose, which is a debate in and of itself, right? What, what serves public purpose, okay? But once you've settled on whatever that is, how do you get from here to there? So the way I like to look at it is like your pile of stuff. So your real wealth is everything you can produce at home domestically at full employment. So you always want everybody working so you have as much stuff as possible. And that includes services, medical services, teaching assistance, you know, all kinds of stuff. That's all your real output. Plus, everything the world sends to you adds to your pile of stuff. So if the world, if India wants to do my programming, that adds to my stuff. And I didn't, because I couldn't, do, I've done it myself. I've already got everybody working. The only way I can get any more is if I get somebody in India to send me more stuff. Minus what we have to send to them. So imports makes your pile bigger. Exports makes your pile smaller. The trick is to get your pile as big as possible, and you want the quality to be what you want it to be. You know, you can pass laws that put people in prison, and then you pile of stuff includes more prisoners and more guards. Well, okay, fine. You know, that's, that's not my idea of how to build like a, the way, place I want to live, right? I'd rather like not have the criminals, so we don't have to have the prisons, and we don't have to have the guards. So anyway, but that's a political decision, and people are. I say humanity is a work in progress, right? <laughs> okay, so. So for India, they want to optimize. So what you want to do is always keep full employment domestically. So what's the unemployment rate in India? Well, it's been going up, I think, because of the slowdown. And so what do you do? Well, why is unemployment going up? For the size government you have, you're overtaxed. Or for the size tax you have, you need more government. My guess is probably, you know, probably there's enough government, probably needs to be redistributed a little bit. But maybe not. I don't know. Uh, you know, it might be too many bureaucrats, there might not be enough, right? So you, you have to decide that. It's a political decision. Uh, there are probably not enough actual public services reaching people who need it, that ratio. But th these are all, for the purposes of this discussion, micro problems that are just as important. Because you can get the macro right and have a really bad place to live. So, but without the macro, you're going to have a bad place no matter what you do at the micro level. So you've got to get the macro first, and the micro is critical. But, you know, Okay, so it's got to rain. You can have the best crops and everything else, but if it doesn't rain, you got a problem. Or, you know, if the water's draining out, you got a problem. Okay, so, India needs to either cut taxes or increase public spending to stay at full employment. 
and you want to do it efficiently and you want to do it the best you can but you want to stay so your pile of domestic stuff stays there okay and you want to optimize your real terms of trade which is to have let people you want to for whatever exports you have, you want to get as many imports as possible. And once you're at that level, the, foreign, the exchange rate at the macro level doesn't matter. So the way I used to say it in Australia, because it's easy, we'd be at Newcastle and you could see the ships all lined up full of coal. The ships would leave Newcastle full of coal, go to Hong Kong, then they'd come back full of television sets. And so they would export coal and import television sets. It's not really the same boat because they'd be all dirty and all that. They use different boats. But just for the example. Okay, so a certain amount of coal will exchange for a certain amount of television sets on the world market. It doesn't matter what the level of the Australian dollar is. It doesn't even matter if there isn't an Australian dollar. In South Africa, the boat leaves with gold, it goes to London, and comes back full of men's suits, right? It doesn't matter whether there's a currency or not, or whether the rand's up or down. A certain amount of gold will exchange for a certain amount of men's suits on the world's market. It's, all, it's been like one ounce of gold for men's suit, it might go up or down. The amount of stuff you get in return for what you're giving, those are your real terms of trade. So economics is like the opposite of religion. It's better to receive than to give, right? <laughs> okay. So for, you want to get the most TV sets crammed into that boat you can for the amount of coal, but you can't control those world prices like that. And, and so, um, so why does the currency matter? The currency determines who has to dig the coal and who gets to watch the television sets. It's a distributive distribution issue. And that can be tr controlled by internal policy. But you don't want the internal policy to cause your pile to be smaller. You don't want it to reduce the amount of coal you dig, apart from global warming. <laughs> but that's uh, another story. Or, to reduce your real goods and services, your medical services, and your educational services. You don't want that. You know, get the most out of that. If you've got a distributional problem, there are plenty of other ways to address that. You've got your own tax structures, your spending. Everything government does is distributional. So use that for the distribution. So if the, if the currency in India goes up or down, stay at full employment. Optimize your real terms of trade by eliminating all import restrictions. So you can get the most for what you sell. You're already selling a certain amount. You want to be able to get more for that. All right? And then you will optimize your real wealth and your real terms of trade and then deal you know, with the distributional issue, which is a severe, of course. And then there are you know, other policies for dealing with those, which you've got to do in any case. But you don't want to let them cut off your actual output of, let's call it, useful and desired real goods and services. Does that address it? or? So the 20% devaluation is going to hurt some people, help others, right? It's going to hurt consumers buying, but the exporters are going to make more. So if you've got, you know, internal policies that make sure the distribution of consumption is, you know, equitable, then you're going to be okay. If you don't, is this thing beeping up? Heat warning. <laughs> There's a heat alert for Kansas City. Yeah, Anybody leave any pets in your car? <laughs> oh, I'm ready. Okay, anybody else? Yes. Okay. Um... I think it's unsustainable in a bad way. So I talked to a senior German economist from Germany in Washington about two months ago. And I'm going to give people some background for this stuff. So here's the problem. GDP in the U.S. was $16 trillion last year or something like that. That means $16 trillion got bought and $16 trillion got sold. Because you can't buy something from somebody without him selling it to you. If you bought a pair of shoes, the store sold a pair of shoes. If you bought some personal trainer's time, he sold you his time. So you can look at it from either the income side or the, the sales side, right? And so uh, that means $16 trillion in income was earned, and think of it as that income then bought the $16 trillion in output. 
because it's always equal after the fact. It's an accounting identity. If 16 trillion in output got sold, there was 16 trillion in input of, of income that bought the 16 trillion of output. It equals the 16 trillion. Okay. That means for everybody who spent less than their income, somebody spent more than their income, or that output would not have gotten sold. So if, if out of that 16 trillion, your income happened to be a trillion and you didn't spend any of it, there's only 15 trillion left to get spent. Well, how did 16 trillion get sold? Somebody spent a trillion more than their income. Because if we already know the 16 trillion got sold, that's our starting point. So we know that for last year, for everybody who spent less than their income, someone spent more. And there's like no way around that. Because it's just a close two sides of the ledger. Okay. So we know last year government spent a trillion more than their income. That's the deficit. They spent a trillion, they taxed a trillion. Okay, and so they made up for somebody else who spent a trillion less than their income. Well, who was that? That might have been China or Japan who sold things and didn't spend the money. Might have been somebody putting money in their pension funds. Might have been, could have been anybody, right? Okay, so in general, people spend less than their income. Most economies, they spend less than their income. It's made up by government spending more than its income, but not always, okay? And those are called, when you spend less than your income, you're called a demand leakage. You had the ability to buy something, which is called demand, aggregate demand, but the effect of demand wasn't there because you didn't spend it, you just saved it. Okay, you, and savings, in this case, is just unspent income. That's all we're talking about, right? So, all of a sudden this year, government decides to raise taxes and cut spending. And now it's proactively spending $250 billion less. So instead of spending a trillion more than its income, it's only spending $750 billion more than its income. And it's actually less than that because taxes went up and spending went down because of lower unemployment compensation and um, higher tax payments because the economy did better, which I'll explain in a second. So it went down. You know, government spending went down by 500 billion. Well, for the GDP to be the same or grow, somebody else has to spend more than their income by 500 billion to make up for the government not spending it because you're going to have, you know, 16 trillion in income and you're only spending 15 and a half. The output's not going to get sold. Some businesses are going to not be able to sell their stuff because there's not enough spending. Okay, well, that's some other sector has to spend more than its income. Some other entity. Somebody. Okay. Well, the private sector did indeed spend $250 billion more than its income. An additional $250 billion more than its income because, you know, we can sort of measure that. And that's why government spending came down the first $250 billion. So let me say that again. It was 16. The government was spending $4 trillion. Okay, and taxing three. It went up to three and a quarter because people were borrowing to spend and paying taxes. So there was debt that caused incomes to go up, that caused taxes to get paid, that brought the deficit. But the next 250 billion from the payroll tax hike uh, and the sequesters, there wasn't anybody borrowing to spend that. The government just out of the blue eliminated 250 billion of net spending. So now, the question is, can anybody else in the economy step up to fill the gap? We had mortgages going up a little bit. Not, not actual mortgages, but house, house purchases. Mortgage credit was actually going down a little bit. And we had some, uh, some, a little bit of business spending and car sales up a little bit. There, there are a few things. So we, I look now to say, OK, since year end, who's stepping up with their borrowing to make up the gap? And if they're not, what happens? the output doesn't get sold, growth is going to be lower. Right, so first quarter, I don't see it, but first quarter's reported up 2.5%. It's like, I don't know, I don't see it. I go through every number I can. Consumer borrowing, dogs borrowing, you know, anything I could find, foreign sector, can't find it. Okay, I'm wrong, I don't know where I'm wrong, it must be somewhere, I mean two and two has got to be four. Second quarter comes along, a couple of months before it's over, they revised the first quarter down twice to 1.7 and then to 1. It's like, okay. Now it adds up. <laughs> All right, here comes second quarter. I still don't see it. 
I'm looking at a little bit of housing, but then it gets revised down, so I don't see that. It comes out 1.8 or something, a little higher than I thought, but okay, maybe. Revised up to 2.5. Why was it revised up? Unsold inventories. Corporations built stuff but couldn't sell it or didn't sell it. Fits my narrative. They needed people to go into debt to buy the output. They did go into debt. Businesses stuck with it. Okay, you grow that one period where they went out on a limb, but then the next period, they don't do that again. Not only that, they cut back because of what they already have. Okay. The other thing that went up was exports. I'm going like, how can exports go up that much? This doesn't make any sense because the rest of the world's dropped dead, cold, you know, out. Japan just devalued, but oh, that wasn't until the end of the quarter. Okay. So, um, then I look at the first quarter, and they had a drop in exports and it went up in the second quarter. So maybe you average the two together. Okay, now we're at, if you figure that out, we're still at 1.5% in the second quarter. Third quarter is estimated to be 3%. Deutsche Bank is still there. Why? The Fed's estimating this growth. Why? Well, they think monetary policy is going to work. No further explanation. <laughs> no channels, no anything, portfolio balancing or some nonsense, but they think it's going to work. All the Fed forecasts include what they call is the effects of appropriate monetary policy. So if you're on the Fed board and you give your forecast, it includes what you're going to do about it if, you do, if things are slow, you're going to do something to make them grow. If it's too fast, you're going to do something to slow it down. All right? So how can you not forecast 2.5%? It implies that if it's less than that, you're powerless to bring it up there, or that you're just malicious and won't do it. <laughs> okay, so and how can you forecast more? Well, you can't, because that's above trend, whatever that means. And you're going to do something to slow it down. So they're not wrong, their forecast, and they're not lying. They'll tell you. It includes their belief that they're going to act with appropriate monetary policy. Well, that kind of makes it worthless, right? <laughs> and so, uh, but this is still there. They haven't changed it yet. So now, numbers come out today. Personal income and spending last month July only grew at 0.1. They were thinking 0.2 or 0.3. Well, that's a big difference. So Goldman revises their third quarter estimate down. And some more numbers came out over the last couple of weeks. New home sales not only were down for July um, after mortgage rates went up in July because well, they're, they're signed contracts, right? They're not completions. So yeah, that would be a surprise. But they also revised down May and June. Now, I don't know if that's going to you know, mean further downward revisions in GDP eventually or not. I, who knows what, you know, I'm not that close to how they do that, but it might. And, but it's fitting the narrative that the third quarter is sloping down from the second quarter. The jobs report went from 200,000 to 160 from June to July. Oh, that's just an outlier. It was this, it was government. Blah, blah, blah. Maybe. But maybe it's the fact that when you get no growth in sales, what corporations call top line growth, you don't hire people. If you are hiring people and you get no sales, that's called negative productivity. You got more people working to produce the same output. That doesn't happen today. Okay, when corporations are pretty smart, they get more from the same people every year, 1%, 2%, they don't get less. So when you've got no sales and jobs going up, you got productivity doing this, something's gonna give. Either GDP is gonna jump up or nobody's gonna hire anybody because they don't have any sales to serve. And so, third quarter is down to 1.5%, which is about equal to productivity. How can there be any job growth? Well, I'm sure there'll be some, because there are lags in this stuff. But if it stays there, it's not going to happen. It's going to go back to zero. So, here we are coming into the third quarter, and even worse, the deficit's now down to 3% of GDP. In past cycles, that might have been enough to keep growth going. But this time around, the credit structure it's pretty much stone cold dead. And that, that probably isn't enough. Okay, there isn't enough consumer borrowing. Now let's look at what happened in the last cycles in consumer borrowing that we don't have th this cycle. So what was the consumer borrowing that drove the Bush expansion? This is subprime fraud, <laughs> for lack of a better word. You're making $30,000 a year, you go out and borrow $300,000 to buy a house, you buy it, the economy is booming. That's great while, while it lasts. That expansion phase was somebody spending more than their income 
which is what we need now for the economy to grow. Well, it works, but we're never going to let that happen again. In fact, if we knew what was happening at the time, we probably wouldn't have let it happen to begin with, and the Bush economy would look like it looks today. The only thing that changed it was, you know, getting hoodwinked by this subprime expansion. So let's go back to the previous cycle. Clinton's cycle was pretty boring, slow growth. Uh, and then all of a sudden it picked up. Why? We had all the dot-com boom going, all these IPOs, new issues, companies borrowing in the equity markets to spend on impossible business plans. The, the private sector going into debt, 7% of GDP, unheard of, unsustainable. Then the Y2K thing, you better do all new systems because the planes are all going to fall out of the sky. Remember all that? Well, that grew the economy until it was over. Y2K happened, the planes didn't crash, but the economy did because the borrowing stopped. And Bush didn't have enough sense to cut taxes and raise spending, you know, because they wanted to preserve the surplus, <laughs> whatever that meant. Okay, but the point was that cycle. Now, here's an interesting one. What drove the Reagan years? So everybody will tell you, you go look it up, Reagan cut taxes. Great, you know, that's how you get back to full employment. Congress increased spending. Great. The deficit went up to $3 trillion from $1 trillion. Okay. Helps. But what else happened? The savings and loan fraud. Okay. The government wrote off $330 billion in losses from the FSLIC in the late 80s sometime. Well, how many bad loans were made to write off $300 billion of losses? At least a trillion. Because even in the worst case, you don't write off 100% of your whole thing, right? There was a trillion dollars in borrowing to spend at the SNL level. Back when that was huge, that used to be a lot of money, by the way, <laughs> in the 80s. You have no idea how much a trillion dollars worth of I don't even think they, had the, they invented the word back then. Right? Uh, billion was, the 330 billion was staggering. Okay. That is what propelled that up leg where all that was being borrowed to spend, that deficit spending, spending more than income, drove the Reagan years. So we're never going to let that happen again. And if you're old enough to remember the decade before that, it was all this dollar lending to Latin America and every place else with Wall Street Ariston, with his sovereigns never, go, never default and all this stuff. We're not, never going to let that happen again either. Brady bonds, all this stuff, they eventually came out of it. And all the write-offs and in the early 70s, the whole banking system, technically bankrupt, you know, subpar capital. Okay, so if you look at the last four economies that we had were okay. They weren't even that great, you know, if you really look at it. Four or five percent unemployment is not it's okay. No big deal. They were, the only reason we were even that far was credit expansions that if we had it to do over again, we would never allow that to happen, right? Any of those. We're on the lookout now. We're vigilant to make sure none of that happened. How about Japan? Massive credit expansion in the mid-80s. Same thing. Burst. 91. Stock market went from 50,000 to I don't know, 10,000 or something. It's still only at 13,000. How many years later? 35 years, 33 years later. It's still at 25% of what it was, you know, at the peak. They say stocks will come back eventually. Yeah, right. They will. <laughs> Even after we're all dead. <laughs> Even after the long run. Super long run. So, um, Japan, since the crash, has been very diligent about not allowing any kind of fraudulent credit expansion. You've seen none of that. They've been really good at it. And what do they have? Three lost decades, right? And zero interest rates the whole time. And more quantitative easing than anybody, than they have calculators to go up that high. It's probably a quadrillion or something. And it doesn't work. Okay? And so what I'm saying is, if we look back at the previous cycles, how large of a total deficit, public and private, did we really need for a modest expansion, a whole lot higher than what we have now. And we're not getting it from the deficit the government. The government's still talking about lowering it. Debt ceiling coming up. Both sides agree. Boehner comes on. You know, look, I don't care what they say. The government's spending more than it's taken in, and we've got to address that problem. Okay. I, I think it looks bad. So you're asking how it looks for Europe. So what's, right, how about that? I remember the question. <laughs> So what has Europe done? Okay, raise taxes, cut spending, to balance the budget. They've got their demand leakages, their savings. How, where, who, what is going to spend more than their income to get the output sold? And I was talking to, 
I don't know if I said I was talking to this German economist a couple of months ago, and he agreed. I said, look, I don't think it's going to be the private sector, because if you look at the banking system and the loans and nobody qualifies and business is not going to be borrowing here, he goes, no, they're just, there's no credit growth there. It's not going to happen. I said, then you look at the uh, foreign sector, they're not going to be able to net export anything into this world right now. Everybody's in the same boat. And not only that, if they do export, because they're not doing what an exporter does, which is buy the foreign exchange, if you do gain a little, little edge in exports as Europe, and you've seen it over the last 15 years, the currency just goes up to where it takes that out, it takes that away and, and drives it back to where, where it started from. The export model is you've got to suppress domestic demand with tight fiscal, which you're doing. That drives your exports, but then you've got to buy foreign exchange to keep your currency at a level where you're, quote, competitive, where you're the world's slaves, where you keep your real wages down so that you can net export. Well, not, they, they won't buy dollars. Why? It's ideological. It's not even economic. Europe wants to be, they want their currency to be the reserve currency. Okay, if they buy dollars, then it looks like the dollar's backing the euro. We don't want that. So they're not even, it's not even a consideration. Germany didn't have that problem when they were on their own. They had $50 billion back when that was a lot of money in the 90s. Uh, they didn't care if anybody thought that was back in the mark or not. They were getting their exports and being the world's slaves and proud of it. Okay, and so, um, so they're not going to get exports. So that leaves the governments. You know, what are the odds of Europe increasing the Maastricht limits from 3% to 8 what they need? Like, zero, right? They're going the other way. Didn't France just do a balanced budget amendment or something? In Italy, they're all going to zero. They think the debt is the problem. They think the deficits are too high when they're too small. So, that, so I got this German economist saying, he doesn't think there's any way out. I said, well, and he said, there's no way they're ever going to reverse the SDR. He said, he said, their attitude is they've come too far now to go the other way, no matter how much theory or evidence they've got. They're just not going to do it. So the limit then becomes social destruction. And this guy agrees with me. He's not a German economist in his government, 40s or 50s. He understands the sectors. He understands what's going on. And he just says it's going to be social, casually says it's going to be social destruction. Now, a year ago, they never would have said that. And, pr and he's probably one of the few that would dare say that. The others are all giving you some double talk about how you can get the banks, you know, recapitalized and then they'll get the credit expansion. They don't recognize it's limited by borrowers. Or, you know, they'll come up with some nonsense story about how it's going to work. And then they'll show how uh, unemployment dropped in Spain by a tenth of one percent. So it's working. So, okay. <laughs> no. And so uh, I see right now the path to social destruction with no monetary or fiscal policy that's going to make it any better. And in fact, bringing interest rates down makes it worse. And I said that, was it a year ago or was it 2011? Two, when, when Draghi came in and said he'll do what it takes, when was that? May 2011? 12. 12? 12. Okay. Yeah, I was at Rimini at the time. Actually. I was up there talking. So he said, do what it takes. They've solved the solvency problem. Rates are going to come down. There's not going to be any financing problem. Nobody's going to miss a penny. But they haven't done anything for the economy. That's going to continue to get worse. There are two separate problems. And in fact, when rates come down, the governments are paying less interest. The economy has less interest. It makes their deficits smaller. It adds to the problem. And that's what they're doing now. Uh, and then they do this thing where the debt's the problem, right? So Greece, they eliminate 80% of their debt with PSI, where they basically just take confiscate it, right? Or uh, renounce it. You had a hundred dollars, hundred euro worth of bonds. You've got eight. You've got twenty. Fine. It brought their deficit down by a hundred billion euro. What did it do to the economy? It got worse. Okay. Now you can argue the social aspects of who's making the money and who's losing the money, but just looking at the macro numbers, when you reduce this stuff, you make it worse because the problem is the deficit's too small, not too large. So. You can confiscate money from really bad people, but you're still making the economy worse. And you should confiscate money from bad people. Huh? I'm not against that. But you better unconfiscate it from somebody else. You better lower somebody's tax or hire somebody to make up for that because you've got a macro problem with these cards, right? You've got to spend enough to cover the tax bill and the need to save. When you take away the savings, now somebody else needs it. It's still there. So let's skip to Cyprus where they um, decided to tax bank deposits. So what is a tax on bank deposits? You got $100 in the bank, there's a 10% tax, a year later you have 90. 
what is a negative interest rate? Well, let's say a neg interest rates are negative 10. You have $100 in the bank, a year later you have 90. Okay, what's the difference? <laughs> taxing bank deposits is negative interest rates. They all scream bloody murder about taxing bank deposits and how it hurts the economy, and they're right. But now they're talking about the ECB has another tool, negative interest rates. Because if you lower interest rates, that's good. We know it isn't. You take the in interest income away, you're a net payer interest. You make them negative, it's even better. It's not, you're just increasing the tax. You're just making it worse. You're taking net financial assets out of the economy. Okay, you're causing a lot of people to squirm and do stupid things, you know, make tough decisions, but you're not helping the economy. You're making it worse. Taxes takes debit, debits are bad, credits are good. It's not that hard. Negative interest rates are debits. Spending is credits. Okay, taxes are debits. Loans are credits. <laughs> Well, my parents have money in the bank. They're saving for retirement. They're in retirement. They're 92 years old. Let's say you took away, you're going to take their bank deposits away. Are they going to go out and spend it? Or are they just going to cut back some more because now they have to live on less and they know it's shrinking and it causes huge anxiety? Would it, if you know you're losing your money, would you go spend it? Why don't you spend it now? Because you're not going to lose it. You might. But I think at the macro level, it's not. I think at the macro level, it's suddenly... So what's your point? <laughs> yeah, I know, they all do that. It's because they got the interest rate backwards. If you got the interest rate straight, interest is a subsidy, positive interest is a subsidy, negative interest is a tax, right? You're either adding interest income to the economy or you're taking it out. Stephanie did a paper on that, showed the macro effects. Matt and I did a paper on that, 1998, zero natural rate of interest. It's a spectrum, it's a very simple spectrum. Maybe too simple, right? <laughs>